money, losing money, and it's hard to make day-to-day -day decisions and run your operation like a business. So we're very appreciative of what they do and how they do things. Okay, can I get the bank staff to come in? Let me introduce some of the people here. Sarah Horner uh, works in our Leroy branch in different places. Some of you might know Sarah. David Weiss uh, is at Flanagan, and Logan Weber is kind of at Flanagan, you're at Flanagan and Benson and helping me out a lot of times. So we're kind of all over the place. And Audrey, is she still here? Yeah. Okay, she'll, Audrey will come in. Audrey is our bank president. And she was greeting you at the door. There's not too many banks that would have the CEO greeting you at the door. <laughs> so I appreciate that. We have, we have Pat Crowley, who uh, kind of, whatever needs done at the bank, he does that, and we appreciate it. Uh, credit analyst, and he's been a jack of all trades, and we appreciate him being here. We appreciate the Stillers for letting us use this facility and their hospitality and helping us tonight. Okay, uh, we have refreshments back there. So during the program, we're not gonna take a break, but if you wanna go, get up and go to the restroom, they're off to the, to the left-hand side in the lobby. And uh, if you want any of the treats, go back and get them. So I'm gonna turn it over to our speaker. And Bob, you wanna, I don't have all your biography and everything. He is the CEO of FBFM in Champaign. And I've heard a lot of great things about, he's the go-to tax guy. <laughs> So, and I, so that's good enough. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thanks All for coming right. with us. Well, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to our session tonight. It's great to be with you. Uh, my home is on Highway 24, but it's two and a half hours west of here. So, you're not quite halfway to Pike's Peak, but you're a long way when you get there. <laughs> Uh, my wife said, what are you going to wear tonight? I said, well, I'm going to wear a suit. I'm the presenter. And she goes, well, at least it'll look like you know what you're talking about. <laughs> Usually when people introduce uh, eat me for the first time, I want you to know three things about me and uh, my wife, Debbie, who I've been married to for 40 years, almost 41. And that is three things. That most Sunday nights, uh, she makes me a pizza and a Pepsi to finish off our weekend. The last three cars I've had are all white sedans. And I've had the same hairstyle for the last 15 years. I don't think any of those things will be changing very soon, especially the last one. So great to be with you. Uh, anytime we have a chance to talk with farmer producers who have one of the most important jobs in the world, I heard a person speak yesterday that said, you know, in agriculture today, we are producing as much food as we ever have in a plentiful manner, in the lowest cost manner, in the safest manner, in the least environmentally predictable manner or harmful manner and in the most plentiful and variable manner we've ever had before. And that's all kudos to the people like you who produce that food for all of us to consume. And that's why we're here tonight to talk about, let's keep that going. How are we gonna make sure this thing works for the next hundred years? I was with the family yesterday and the elder statesman of the family is a three-generation meeting exactly on this topic. And the elder statesman of the family said, I'd like to see my farm continue for the next hundred years. And we thought about that for a minute. I said, well, when did your farm start? And he said, well, it was settled in 1845. So that's less than 200 years. It's been his family operation so far. And he's thinking about the next 100 years. So really, Succession planning, transition planning, estate planning is kind of a new venture for us. It hasn't been around for 200 years. It really hasn't been around for even 100 years because we didn't have income taxes until the early 1900s. I'd be curious about this neighborhood here. How many of you have farms that started a long time ago? And can you think off the top of your head when your farm first became in your family? Anybody before 1990? Well, yeah, sure, a lot of those. What are some old years we have in this neighborhood of when your farm started? I saw you nodding your head. 1872. Others? It's kind of like the anniversary dance at wedding receptions. That probably happens here, right? Who's going to last the longest? 1867. 1867. Yeah. But still not 200 years but a long, long time. Other old years? One more? Gary, you know the neighborhood better than I do, but what have you seen from this neighborhood? We have 
1850s, 1860s, that's when it all started? Probably. I wouldn't be surprised from that standpoint. There's a lot of mental back to the generations. Yeah, still. 1850, long time ago. We have a plaque in our yard. It says, this farm was settled by William and Verlina Walker Farlow, who came from High Point, North Carolina in 1848. And that's in our yard because that's the farm they settled, and I still live there. That was my great-great-grandfather, and that's still part of our family heritage today. So we're obviously not farm family, but we come from one, and we want to talk about succession planning and how that's going to help uh, you and your families uh, going forward. So mention our staff who are in your neighborhood, in these offices. We have a great team of people not far uh, from Gridley and Flanagan. Uh, you might know some of those names and where they are located, but those are our offices in this general region. And today we still mourn the loss of our good friend Mike Heiser from Fairbury, who lost his cancer battle a couple of weeks ago who was a, was a stalwart in this region for a long, long time. Uh, so we continue to miss Mike. But those are the people that are helping us today, and it's a mixture of seasoned veterans and new people. Uh, Morgan, for example, has been with us, and Eric both, for less than a year. But Jed, 15 years, Nathan, 20 years, uh, Darren Gray, 20 plus years, Jeff Marquis, and, J and Lowell over in Eureka. 15 plus years, so good people to help do the work uh, that I used to do. Uh, I had that job for 35 years uh, in Camp Point in Western Illinois and did all of these things for the farm families in Adams, Brown, Pike, and Hancock counties uh, since 1984. Their company's been around since 1924, but I have been here since 1984. And we do accounting, consulting, performance benchmarking, tax planning and preparation. And that's what those people on the slide before are doing today. Gary said he did some of that this morning. All of our people are doing that all day, every day right now. Farm tax planning, getting ready for year end. We are a group of trusted professionals who share unbiased information. And this is the big part. Their goal every day is helping farm families continue to be successful in finding new ways to serve uh, Illinois farmers. We have about 5,300 members, 13,000 clients around the state. Uh, we have 225 staff members. That's at our peak uh, during processing season, January, February, March. Normally, it's a 125 level. 37 office locations. We have 11 board members. Nine of those are elected, and two of those are appointed. And we have uh, board meetings in Bloomington the next two days. Uh, our big thing is on-farm visits. Our staff like to get right in your business location and understand what is important to you and how they can help make things better. And that's the accounting software we use, PC Mars, from our friends at Iowa State. So let's get to some of the numbers. You know, a lot of my presentations are number-based. Uh, that's where we thrive, and uh, Sarah said she was in one of our tax schools uh, in prior years and has had to listen to me for multiple hours talking about income tax things, so kudos to her for making that happen. All right, let's talk about uh, net farm incomes from, for Illinois farms. And we're interested not only in the history, but also the forecast. Because as we think about succession planning, what is there in the future to make this thing work? So here is our history. This goes back to 1996. And kind of flat here before we had the 03 jump when ethanol started to raise its head a little bit, 03 to 06. We had some good years in here. A big recession, of course, in 09, like lots of places. Rebounded and right here, the highest income year ever in 2012. In our area, it was one of the worst production years ever, but incomes were pretty high. Prices high, government payments high, didn't have as much harvesting expense, crop insurance payments without very much uh, expense. Best year ever, 2012. And right here, three years later, worst year ever in the 50 years we keep track of this number. So from the very best to the very worst in a three-year span, uh, depending which peer group you're looking at, it was zero, minus 4,000, plus 3,000, just call it zero. Some good bounce back years here in the early uh, teens, and then in 20, we ended up at about 160, or I'm sorry, 268, 260,000 net income for 2020. Our forecast this year is even better. This will be a brand new record if that holds true at 325,000. 
Uh, I don't know. I mean, the, the yields are not as good as they finished off as what we thought when we wrote this slide a few months ago. I don't know if we'll reach that number, but I bet we'll beat uh, the record here. And then here's what we're really interested in. So what about 22 under this scenario or this scenario? And what we're looking at is the potential of a loss year if we have $4 corn and $10 beans and still high input costs. Now, I don't think all of that will ever work out the same way. It shouldn't, right? If we have dropping commodity prices, our input costs should decline, rent should settle. I don't know if that will happen. You all know more than I that those cost declines are pretty sticky and hard to make happen. The commodity price adjustments very rapidly occur. So depending on whether we have uh, an average prices, uh, lower prices, I should, I should say higher prices, average prices, or lower prices, this income swing is from a plus 130 forecast to a loss of 65,000. So that just means other things have to adjust if we land at these uh, price levels. This is nothing new, right? Have you, have you bought fertilizer for 2022 already? Uh, can you get it? I had three calls a day asking about tax issues like they were saying, we are going to buy our prepay tomorrow, but we can't buy any products. I'm writing a check for 85,000, but there is no product on the invoice, no quantity, because they can't guarantee I can get it. Can I use that as a tax deduction? And they're gonna pay me interest on my money. No, that doesn't sound like a tax deduction to me, not a valid prepaid expense. But everybody's dealing with this. This was a few weeks ago, or September, I'm sorry, September. What's the price of anhydrous in your neighborhood today? 1400 1500 1587 I saw a quote for last week in the western part of the state. So those are certainly record high numbers, adding a lot to cost per acre for 2022, contributing to declines in net income. And the reason I bring this up is, as we think about succession, you know, that's a, a long-term arrangement. And there's a lot of volatility that's happening in the farm sector today. So just pointing out how much those things move and how important that is as you create a succession plan going forward. I just picked this one up, but cost per acre to produce corn. Uh, we have up to 747 forecasted for next year up $140 from this year. That's about a 25% jump in this one year. Record highest ever. We thought these years were crazy, crazy high. And that was after our record income year of 2012. I mentioned our worst income year was 15, but look how sticky they were to drop in cost. Not much from the records. When we push this cost up, it takes a long time for them to even settle and now we're gonna be at brand new territory in production costs per acre. Again, we're interested in the long-term effect of operator and land returns. So this results in a re net return to land measured in cash rents. And so for corn to blue, the beans or the red, net operator and land returns for corn and beans, and then this line is where the cash rents are falling. So we've paid for everything in your corn and soybean budget on this slide, except for two things, the owner's land and the operator's time. And that has to come out of these final charts, these bar graphs that are here. And we're saying the rent was taking this much of every bar, which meant the rest was available for the tenant, the farmer, the operator, the manager. And so land rents take a big part of those overall returns, except in really big income years, the operator can make some extra money. And there are a few years here where the rents took all the profits, especially from corn, and didn't leave anything returned to management. So here is a more detailed look at all of the counties in Illinois. And let's see, this county is, are we here? Yes. Yeah. So 226, uh, this county. This is McLean, I guess, right? 262. Um, Ford, 249. Champaign drops over here at 270. 
This is my home county, 172. Our land's not that good. <laughs> and maybe that's a little light because our neighbors to the north are 226. But there's a big difference in these two counties on how farming happens. We hired a young person a few years ago who grew up in this county, 4-H FFA in this county, knew this county in and out. And he got clients in this county, he said, oh my goodness, I can't believe how much difference there is in 20 miles of driving. It was just a really different way they operated here with the capital they used, the size of the farms, the grain bin systems they had. That doesn't happen in my home, Adams County. We're a pretty low key county over there on the western side of the state. You know what's here, right? Missouri. So we're a lot more like Missouri than we are in Illinois in a lot of ways. But lower rents here, uh, all these greens are over 200. Uh, if we go to southern Illinois, we're down into, I can't read some of those, 128, 119, 140 in this part of the state. That one says $52 an acre, not much there. And uh, I guess this is the high mark, this is the darkest green right here, 311. And that would be, hmm, Pyatt, Christian, Macon. Macon, yeah, Macon County right there, Decatur area. This is me, then this would be Sangamon County. So 311 right there is the highest rent. In 2021, as reported by the National Ag Statistics Service, and that would have been a survey in August is when they did that information. Well, as we think about succession, one of the things that the landowners like is cash rent, and that puts a lot of risk on the tenant. And oh, one more slide I want to mention about this. So in this county right here, this is Brown County, not a very big county, but we have a client there who retired. 2021 was their last year of farming. And they were paying lots of family rents in the $225 an acre range. And I often said, I think you're a little light. You got a pretty good farm, they gotta be 250, maybe 275 in some of these good income years. Thought that seemed strong. The farmer retired and rented his land out to another farming operation and he's collecting for 22, 425. So just interesting how things are changing so rapidly. So one of the features that we like to promote is some, torp some type of flex, flex rental arrangement that's not solely based on a fixed rental price. And I think of it from a couple of ways. You know, we represent the landlords and the tenants both. We gotta have a good deal for everybody or it doesn't work. And we know if the operator is picking up all these acres, we know the risk they're taking on. They're gonna spend $711 to plant a corn crop next year and hope that 18 months later, they have sales from that acre of 850. It's a long time to make that investment. And so as we think about succession, one of the things that we have seen successful is something like this. So this is a fixed rent of $200 an acre, paid however the normal is in the neighborhood. And what's normal here for cash rent payments? Some in advance, some split in two times. What would be a normal arrangement in uh, this county? Anyone knows what those are? Typically several installments. S multiple installments? Several installments pretty of Loaded up front or loaded at the end? Or all over the board? A lot of them not 50, 50, but it'll be All right. So the farmer that picked up the other a retired farmer, they always pay all their rents March 1, 100%. And in our neighborhood, that seems to be a pretty common thing, a lot of it up front. But that puts a lot of pressure on the successor tenant to finance it, number one, to take the risk, number two, and to be confident that they're gonna get that money back 18 months later. This sometimes helps. We started these mostly in 2014, no, back up, in 2012 and 11 when rents were really ramping up and people wanted to keep farming and they were willing to pay $400 of rent if their gross income was 1200. If their gross income was 700, the $400 rent did not sound very enticing. So we started on some of these. So it starts off with a base, that's paid, whatever your normal arrangement is, in our neighborhood at home, 100% up front. 
If the yield was this, the price was this, this would be the gross per acre. That's a big number. Historically in Illinois, $800 gross is a pretty good number. $700 isn't quite enough. $900 is usually really good. This is a huge number in my math. We have we would establish a trigger in advance of the year. And in this case, we're going to establish a trigger of $750 an acre. And that means at the end of the year, we exceeded our trigger by $250 over the base, and the landlord collects 30% of everything over the base, which would be a $75 bonus payment. So the final rent paid would be $275, $200 up front, and $75 probably in February or March of the following year, once the marketing season is over. And you can pick any trigger here or any tweak these as you would like. Uh, change your base, change the percentage, uh, change how you calculate the price. But the whole idea here is to provide more return to the landowner when there's more return available. Provide less risk to the tenant when there's less return available. It's designed to look something like this. So for years and years, uh, and Gary was a, one of our best FBFM people for a long, long time too, and you've seen these charts many times, Gary, uh, that the university publishes. And the idea is, how does your 50-50, very common arrangement, I get half the crop, pay half the expenses, do all the machinery work, landlord pays the taxes. If we think that 50-50 arrangement is fair and equitable, how does that compare to my overall net return per acre? And what it tells us is over time, if we pick this central Illinois blue line through here, that's going to come out right around this 33% level, maybe 32, maybe 34, but not 35 and not 30. Very, very narrow band here of what the landlord value per acre is. And this past year, 35% here, 34, 32, but overall it's in that one third value. So our family has a small farm in Adams County. It's not that good of soil, it's white timber soil. And our objective every year as the landowner is to get 32% return of the gross revenue. That's what we target in our flex rent arrangement. And sometimes we hit it, sometimes we beat it, sometimes we run short. I was pretty excited this year when I saw a six and seven dollar corn around. This is gonna be a good year to have this flex thing. I called our tenant a few weeks ago, what was our final yield? Because oh, it was bad, really bad, too wet. 140 bushels an acre, that's all we got. So I took that times five, 700, our trigger 750, no bonus, easy math. So that one didn't work out in our favor, but didn't work out very good for the tenant either. He only had 140 bushel of corn to work with, so we're okay with that. This is a, a really good chart to think about. What should your net return to the landowner be? This goes back a long time. It's always in that 30 to 35 percent range, and more narrowly, 32 or 33. So we look at a few years and we think about budgeting going forward for our successor. Uh, what makes sense for them? Well, this chart has some really key factors, corn yield history, bean yield history, crop returns, and here's where I was saying, you know, here's 862, almost 900, really good. Here's almost 800, pretty good. This 17, that's 700, not so good. Lost $51 an acre. Here at 731, we lost $15 an acre. Crop costs, pretty flat here for this time period but 21 and 22 are gonna really climb on this chart. Pro whoops, sorry, probably up 30% or more. <clears throat> Repairs are relatively flat. Uh, management returns, uh, what would that average out of all that be? $100 an acre, maybe? That's probably a little strong. Net return after everything's been paid. And there's the final net farm income number down here. For this study, this group actually averaged 301,000 last year super numbers for net farm income. If we look at a, a longer time period, just at the corn and soybean returns, <clears throat> these uh, show us from 11 to 20, uh, our price received here in green, 
And our cost for everything except the land, we had the land on, got us up to 751 cost in that the time period over here, 426 is our cost, and we have 368. Uh, again, this number is so high because the yields here were so low. Not the dollar number, the yields were terrible. S similar answer on soybeans, high cost per bushel in 2012 because yield was so low. Uh, this year we're at 1025 and a 977 price, I'm sorry, last year. So a small loss here, but that's not the whole story. Because on both of those, there were lots of government payments that are not on those slides that would have added to the profits. That's why the net incomes look good, even though if we look here uh, at the margin, we're short 60 cents a bushel, and here we're short uh, 50 cents a bushel. But government payments more than made up for that deficit. But this, again, as we think about our successor, we don't know what the future is way out here to the right. All we know is what our history's been. Think about the volatility, think about the numbers that make sense for them. This one really, I think, drives home to our successor's abilities, as well as our senior person departing, what their situations might be. So this is debt to asset ratio. Richard, I bet you've got these all over your bank balance sheets, right? Debt to asset ratios for everybody. Total liabilities divided by total assets, and that's gonna tell me my financial risk. Well, one measure of my financial risk. And we're interested in this group here, those that are under 30. So their number is really close to this 50% debt to asset ratio. So that balance sheet looks something like this. They have 100,000 of assets and 50,000 of liabilities, or a million dollars of assets and 500,000 of liabilities. 50% debt to asset ratio. And if we jump down to the group that I'm in, my birthday was Sunday. I'm in this group now. Actually, I have been for two years. But I'm down here, so my debt to asset ratio should be around 10%. Million dollars of assets, 100,000 of liabilities. That's a 10% debt to asset ratio. And you can see as they get older, these numbers are gonna get better, which makes sense. More years of business, more appreciation. These all are going to get better. But think about the mindset of the retiring person who has a 10% debt to asset ratio. And their successor is gonna be probably one of these groups who are in the 40, 50, maybe the very best, 30% debt to asset ratio. More risk, different balance sheet, different things for them to be thinking about as you work together to find a common plan. Now it's fun sometimes to look at someone's balance sheet and Richard, I would challenge your bank to think about this for this season. Do their balance sheet and tell them how old their balance sheet indicates their age really is. So if you do someone here and they come up with a 10% debt to asset ratio, their balance sheet age is 60. And if that individual is only, can I ask how old you are? I'll be 28 this month. If he's only 28, that's a really good age balance sheet. He's got a 60 year old balance sheet at age 28. So it's fun to think about those numbers as, well, what would my age be on my debt to asset ratio chart? And if my debt to asset ratio is 30%, I'm probably 45 years old. And if I'm actually 55, I've got some work to do to catch up. If I'm only 35, I'm ahead of the curve. So age or balance sheet, especially on debt asset ratio. All right, let's think about farm income. This is really what drives the boat. I said I started with FBFM in 1984. And if you were farming or doing anything in ag business in 84, you know that was a terrible time. In Hancock County, our land market crashed in 1987 and I know exactly which farm it was it was our client who sold 500 acres at auction and it was really good dirt in Hancock County and in 1980 the best dirt in Hancock County sold for $4,950 an acre and that farm sold in 1987 for $1,350 an acre and not near enough money to pay off the debt our balance sheets were upside down, way more debt than we had assets. 
Today's financial stress comes from this chart. We don't have enough income to pay all of the bills for the farm operation. We can pay our operating costs, maybe some of our family living, can't pay enough for my income tax, and I struggle with getting my debt service covered. So even though I made 150,000 net farm income, or this chart says as a percent of our, of our gross revenue, 35% really strong here, worst year ever, one and a half percent, last year pretty good, back to 22%. Even though I'm making those kind of margins, the question is, is it enough? And when I gave up my clients and took on my current role two years ago, we had two clients in bankruptcy. One of them had a net worth of eight million dollars. The other one was young, a little older than 28, but not 40. And his net worth was two and a half million. And they were both in bankruptcy because they weren't making enough money to cover all of their obligations. They had positive tax returns. They owed income tax every year but they didn't have enough to pay off their debt and their living expenses. So those guys had operating income ratios of this, one and a half, five or six percent. So of every dollar they received, 98 or 95 cents went somewhere else. Last year, average kept 22% at home for profit. That's a really good number. A lot of businesses would be satisfied with a 12 or 15% operating margin FBFM, we're glad to get 6 or 7% operating margin, uh, but we can get farmers to be very healthy at 20%, but down below 10% is a struggle to keep everything rolling with that income margin. One of the reasons that we have difficulty paying all our bills is living expenses. So this has a lot of stuff on it, so let me kind of chop this up a little bit. This is non-farm income. So someone in the family has a job off the farm, earns a wage, has their own business, whatever that situation is, makes an average over the last five years a little over $40,000. <clears> Farms are worried about income tax, rightly so. It takes a big bite out of cash. The last five years, about twenty-two to $24,000 average income tax paid by farm families in Illinois. These expenses that contribute to living expenses all total up, well, gosh, I'm too fast on that button, all total up here to 82,000, 85, 82, 84, and 81. This is the choppiest I have ever seen living expenses in the history of FBFN data. Otherwise, it's always going up, maybe more like that. But it's usually going up. But we have had success in cutting those costs a little bit along the way. And what's that really meant? It means our trend is about flat. Instead of being up an average of 4 to 6% a year, it's been flat. But we need 80,000 to pay living, 25,000 to pay tax. That means I need 105,000 net income to pay the bills that I need. And I need debt service after that too. When we look at younger operations, their numbers aren't this high, but they're in the 60,000 range and maybe 15 here. So we just have to be cognizant of our successor needs enough money in their arrangement to get these costs covered too. <clears throat> this is interesting. I was surprised how this changed. And I guess I'm not surprised uh, how it con has continued. But again, it's, it's a lot different in, you know, from neighborhood to neighborhood, I know. So this means, how is the land owned and operated? So of all the acres that are operated in our system, if we go back to year 2000, 45% uh, plus of it was crop shared, probably 50-50 with the landlord. And 25% was owned, and 30% was cash rented. And then right here, this year, 2007, it switched. For the first time ever, we had more cash rent acres than crop share. And we thought, oh, that's the ethanol thing speaking to us. That'll revert back to normal pretty soon. It hasn't. It's exaggerated, in fact. So last year, we had 45% cash rented, 30% crop shared. The owned acres have stayed about the same. 
So I don't know if that's common in this neighborhood as well, but this is a pretty important dynamic of farm financial analysis that we've moved away from risk sharing 50-50 to risk absorption by the tenant at 100%. It's different. We have never done it like that. Uh, I guess we've done it like that the last 10 years, but before that, this is a new phenomenon. And maybe it's simplification. Maybe it's ease of billing, ease of keeping track of grain. Maybe it's favorable rents. Maybe it's the fact that we want to be more risky. But something has changed that has really switched these two lines just across them exactly opposite of how farms are being operated in Illinois. <clears throat> Richard, you have this lot in your uh, client's files too, I'm sure. Working capital numbers. This is a balance sheet number that we're now dividing into an income statement number and getting this ratio. So working capital, total current assets, minus total current liabilities. That's my working capital. That's my measure of how liquid my business is, how easy I can address unusual events, how easy it is to expand and buy equipment, how easy it is for me to withstand yield or price reductions, better working capital, more security for the farm operation. And now if we take that number and then go to our income statement and divide that by our operating expenses or by our gross returns, we publish both because banks like this one and other banks like this one. I like this one because that's what I've got to cover. My working capital and my balance sheet has to cover my expenses over time. And we're seeing that this is rising, which is good news. Here's the best year ever, over 80%. We were getting close to having enough working capital to pay all of our expenses for a year. That's a really good number. If you've been on school boards or other government bodies, you look at number of days of cash on hand. And if you have three months of cash on hand, that's maybe okay. Six months of cash on hand, the taxpayers think you're charging too much. And here we are almost to a year's worth of expenses. But look, it's been down as low as 35%, and this will probably take a hit in 23, back down to these lower levels. Again, a measure of risk that's important for our tenants to think about as our successor. All right, that's a lot of the money. Now let's talk about the language. <clears throat> so as we think about business planning, you know, there's a lot written about succession, and all those things. And in my mind, if we think about business planning, there's really four key pieces to this whole story. Number one, you've got to be doing well. You want to strive for operational excellence in your current operation. And if things are not going well, you probably have to get this fixed before you think much about these other three, or you're going to have to do something different before you think about these three. Then these three kind of get blended together, but really they're extremely separate and significantly different pieces of your planning puzzle. So succession, that's why am I giving up my business? I remember this from a long time ago, one of our farms in Pike County was ready for his succession plan. So why are you ready to give it up? He says, I'm 62, I can draw social security and that social security check will make the payment on the house my wife wants at the Lake of the Ozarks. That was his start of his succession plan. All right, so now we know what we're shooting for. But why, are we, why do we need a successor? Who's that person going to be? And how will the business continue forward with me as a successor and my new tenant as a successee? Transition, this is something different. Once we've decided we're gonna do some succession, then the transition plan comes into play. How's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? Where's it going to happen? And how will this successor succeed from step one? How will I get them transitioned into my business? So one of the biggest challenges that we often have with our farm operations that have been in business for a long time as farm <laughs> operators, they have a lot of machinery and a lot of inventory. And that's got to go somewhere. Maybe your successor is going to buy it. Maybe they're going to lease it, but not your inventory. What are we going to do with that inventory? We've got to step that down. 
So one of the transition processes that is very common is this. So I farm a thousand acres, I get all the income off of it as either a cash rent or an owner. And next year as part of my transition plan, I'm gonna give up 200 acres and just crop share that with my successor. And the next year, 600 acres as a crop share. And the next year, 600 acres crop share, 400 acres cash rent. And gradually move that away so you get a chance to lower your inventory over multiple years. In today's price environment, and I mean, yields in this county were good this fall or terrible or average, or how would you classify yields here? It, 21 yields. Average. Good above average. So there's probably a lot of farm grain inventory to deal with, especially at these prices. You can't make that transition in one year from having all your acres to farming none of those acres. Well, you can, but there's going to be a big tax bill in that process. And a lot of cash moving that is maybe difficult. The other piece is your successor is going to pick up tons of risk in one year. So we're thinking about the successor a lot to say, well, let's step your inventory and your operating acres down, 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 down over time. So your inventory declines, your tax liability is manageable, and your successor has a chance to grow into the risk, the financing, the management of those full share acres. So that's what I mean by transition planning. And then finally, estate planning. This is the fun one because now we're back to math here. So where's your property going to go? Uh, what is your income needs for your surviving spouse, primarily, I'm thinking about here? And are there any specific tax issues that need to be dealt with in your estate plan? If you have all this organized, you've got a great plan moving forward for complete succession of your operation. We'll spend the most of our time talking about this one in the next few slides, and a few more about this piece, too. So succession plan. Uh, who's the operator going to be? Who's taking over the operations of your activities? It's more complicated when it's a family. It's more complicated when it's multiple family members in the business. Some will accede to this and want that. Some will shy away and not want the risk, not want the responsibility. And so one of our board meeting discussions on Thursday morning with our group is we're naming our successors in our meeting. And so I've got two people named as my successor and all of our management team people have named their next two successors in case something happens to someone, who's taking over for Bob tomorrow and making decisions? And who do I think in the next five years is someone we want to groom to be the successor for my role? So who's the offer you're going to be? It takes some time to make that determination and help get them ready. We have seen a lot of success across the state about this key piece right here. Dividing up these assets into those that are operational and those that are fixed and, and uh, more highly um, valued and difficult to take over. So here's a quick example. So my operating assets are all my grain inventory and my operating acres. We're going to put those, oh my goodness, look at that. I didn't mean to do that. Uh, it must be the rain. Is that what we hear up there? Mm -hmm. Dividing up these operating assets. So grain inventory is over here. Livestock operation is over here. All the operator acres are in my operating asset bucket. And during my succession, those are all going to go away. I'm going to give up all my operations in one, two, five years, wherever that plan is. The fixed assets stay in a different bucket. That's my farmland. Machinery can kind of go either spot, but I think it's a fixed asset that stays in that bucket. I don't ever want to give up my farmland as a farm operator. I'm going to keep that. I'll rent it, I'll crop share it, but I'm going to keep it. I don't expect my successor to buy all of my land. Maybe they want to buy the 20 acres where the operational center is. That's all right. But mostly, I'm going to keep that. Do not expect my successor to pick up, pick up my fixed assets. To make all that happen, we have to decide what entity choice works best in your succession plan. So proprietor means I don't have an entity. I file a Schedule F, my own individual return, and that's it. And for a lot of operations, that's a great answer. 
Other operations might choose to be an LLC, a limited liability company, tax as a partnership, or you might choose to be a partnership without the LLC moniker. The same with an S Corp, maybe a C Corp, probably not. I would never start a C Corp today in a succession planning process. It doesn't really fit anymore. It fit really well in 1978 when I graduated from high school. That was the right answer, but not today. We have some attorneys who like this, limited liability partnerships, family limited liability partnerships. Acts like a partnership, and what they do is they take all these fixed assets and dump them down here into this LLLP. They put all these operating assets and put them into an LLC tax as a partnership or as an S Corp, depending what you do going forward. We don't create any of these anymore in a succession planning piece and don't create many of these anymore for really any purpose. Uh, but they have a certain place, but not very often. It's usually this one or this one or something like this. But our choices here is, the key to this slide I mean, is taking these and putting them probably here or here and taking these and putting them in something down here. This could also be an LLC that is just an, an ownership LLC too. This is more the language piece. Uh, a lot of people are way better than me about advising about this. All I can say is this is important. Communicating your plan with your family is critical. Communicating your plan with the successor, critical. Ongoing communication with whoever is on your team of lenders, financial people, accounting, tax, legal people, insurance people. You have to have this whole team gathered together so everybody knows how it's going to work so well. There's lots of financial planning that's going to go on, multi-year tax planning probably, because your tax liability will increase once you start to sell down inventory and quit buying equipment, tax liability will go up significantly. And if you couple that with a land purchase, tax liability go up even more because buying land increases tax liability. I haven't mentioned trust yet. And when I pulled in, I noticed there's lots of vehicles in the parking lot. And trusts are just like that. Without telling me more about what you want to do or what you have, if you say you have a trust, all I know is there's a vehicle in the parking lot. And until I know more about what it is, I can tell you it's a white Chevy Impala. It's a black F-250. It's a Z28 Camaro, depending what you have. There's so many different ways about defining what the trust is and what it does. So that is a full study, but I would say most farm families can benefit from having trust in their plan, especially these grantor revocable living trusts. They all kind of mean the same thing. It means I'm going to create a trust. I'm going to put all my assets in there. I'm the trustee. I can change my mind tomorrow if I want, but I can avoid probate. I can simplify estate administration for my heirs. I get zero income or estate tax benefits out of these grantor revocable living trusts. Just makes things simpler for estate administration. Avoiding the probate, keeping it private, all that stuff. They're a great tool for that. Um, my mother passed away a few years ago. She had a revocable living trust, put it together when she was about 75. She died when she was 86, and it worked great uh, because as her health declined, I was a successor trustee. I automatically stepped into her shoes. I could do everything that she could do, and when she passed away, no probate. It cost us $750 to settle her estate. Great, smooth, easy process. I'm glad she put that together uh, a few years before passing. These are different. These are irrevocable trusts. There's all kinds of these too. So this might say there's cars in the parking lot and there's trucks in the parking lot, but there's all kinds of different bells and whistles for each. This is one that's very common in succession planning. Generation skipping trusts. 
So Debbie and I have been married for 41 years almost. We have three children and seven grandsons. No girls in the mix anywhere. Haven't figured out why that happened. But we're expecting a lot of girlfriends to come to the house someday. So maybe that'll be good. So what I could choose to do is skip my three kids and give my land directly to my grandkids. Now they're young. Our oldest is a high school sophomore and our youngest is three. So they can't have that property yet. So I will name a trustee for them until they reach a certain age and then they will acquire their property from the generation skipping trust that I created. And one of the things we do often is maybe spread that out with when they get their property. Here's two extremes I was involved in. <clears throat> one family we met with, they were relatively young. Their kids were high school juniors, not in college. And when they had their succession planning meeting, they said, we're gonna leave our land to our kids and they're gonna get all rights to their land when they're 24. I said, they're, they're, they're 17 now, so in seven years, they could get all of your property and have full rights to it? Is that what you want? Because that probably had a $6 million estate divided by three kids. You're giving them $2 million then? You're comfortable with that? We are. We trust our kids, we like our kids, we think we raised them right, they can have it at 24. We don't care. Okay, that seemed pretty aggressive to me. Not my call. Then we went to another uh, family just this last summer and the attorney told us that he has a generation skipping trust and the attorney is 70 his kids must be 45 or 50 he's skipping them to his grandchildren who are all college age or older and I said do you mind me asking when does your generation skipping trust end he goes yeah I'll tell you when my youngest grandchild is 62 well, will your oldest grandchild be like 75? He said, yeah. They don't get it all until that age. So that's the full other extreme of, I said, what are you doing that for? He goes, well, land isn't our biggest asset, but I'm gonna keep my family land free from liability, you know, as maximum protection as I can for as long as I can. That's a long time. I said, well, that doesn't seem right to me either. Uh, not my call either, right? But he writes them all the time. So two examples of extreme generation trust allowances for kids special needs uh, maybe you have a family member who you'd like to put money aside uh, that they can't have direct access to but it's for their benefit managed by someone you trust to manage their affairs for them this is very common this last one marital or family trust for a surviving spouse so typically uh, what would happen today is if I would die, I'm going to leave my property to uh, in my half of the property in trust for Debbie for her lifetime. It would be a marital trust. She doesn't own it. She gets all the income from it, but she never owns my half. And then her half, when she would pass away, would get combined with the half I left her. Both of those trusts would disappear and the kids would then have it uh, at their ages. So these family and marital trusts are designed to provide for the surviving spouse, but never for the surviving spouse to own the decedent's half. Only for estate tax planning. I'll show you why that's important in a moment. So two different things about trust. So when you get to anyone describing trust, my first thing is I need to know a lot more about what your trust is meant to do and what its purpose is. Uh, we had someone in another office, the field staff called me last week and said, you know, these people you know, I said, yeah, they're doing estate planning. I know they had been. What's the update? They have two LLCs. They have two living trusts. They have two revocable trusts. They're going to create a third LLC. And I said, what are they doing all that for? And they said, they don't know. They have all these documents and don't know really why they have them or what their purpose is, can't define the difference between this purpose and this purpose. You know, I, I, haven't, I haven't worked with them for three years, but I'm sure they have this for a state administration, and I'm pretty sure they have this for generation skipping and for a surviving spouse marital trust. But they don't know what they have. I said, what, what did they spend for that process? 
And did you ask him? She goes, well, I didn't ask, but in their record book, I saw uh, $30,000 they spent to put that plan together. I think that's too much for that size of operation for what they did. I think they have a plan that's too confusing, too complex. Maybe it meets all their goals, but I think they've overspent. What about gifts? Uh, sure, always gifts. Uh, my first exposure to this was early in the 80s. Uh, we had a family who had some farmland, but had a lot of stock they'd acquired from other you know, elder family members over time. And they wanted to give away all their stock to their kids. And I thought, you can't do that. Why would you do that? It'd be a big tax to pay. I was wrong. That's not true. You can do that. And we'll show you that in a moment. Um, but they lowered their estate tax exemption by that gift. But the smart piece about that was they also froze their estate. So when that $500,000 of stock fund they had, when they died was worth 2.2 million, that was not taxed in their estate. It was gone. It was out of their estate. So it worked out well for them. And you know, by fluke, that happened to be at a time when land values had risen and they got the benefit from 2032A, which we'll mention in a moment too. So gifts can be helpful. Does it reduce the estate tax? Yes. Does it important to move property to the next generation? Yes. Uh, how about charitable organizations? Yeah, that's done. People leave money to libraries and schools. Saves the state tax, puts money in a charitable fashion in your community. This is one we don't always remember. Once you've made this gift, it transfers income from the donor to the donee. Maybe that's what you want, maybe not. So we have an example of this that I, I just had a, uh, the field staff called me today about this one. And what had happened uh, earlier this year, the parents had made large gifts to their three adult children. Adult children are all my age. Made large gifts to them, about $2 million a piece. And now, uh, and it was through one of those LLLP entities. And so now what happens is when they look at the LLP income, which used to be almost all mom and dad's, and now was almost all the kids, dad was only getting about $30,000 of income from the LLLP. He was banking on getting his normal $200,000 from the LLLP. And now he says, I don't think that's really what I want. I wanted to get rid of my tax, so I made a big gift, but I forgot to think about my income that I don't have anymore, because I want to buy another farm. So how do we get income back to dad when we give him away all the property? Well, there's a little bit of things we can do, but generally, once we've done this, We've transferred this income away. Maybe that's the goal. In this family's case, you know, they forgot about that. It didn't work out the way that they wanted. They're scrambling now to figure out what they're gonna do about moving this income. Another common gift is to grandchildren for education. These are usually done by these Bright Start or 529 college savings plans. The grandparents give them away because it's more favored for financial aid if the grandparent gives the money instead of the parents putting the money in. Okay, let's think about transferring these assets and benefit from today's extremely low interest rates. IRS publishes these every month. I looked them up today. So if you have a loan that's three years or less, this isn't, these aren't uh, State Bank of Flanagan rates, by the way. You know, these are IRS rates, so. These are for inner activity in your succession plan. If part of my deal is I want to sell machinery to my son at a favored interest rate, you've got to charge at least this much. That's all that it needs. And they're pretty long. If your loan is for three years or less, a third of 1%. It's a low number. If the loan's nine years or longer, only 1.9%, less than 2%. IRS says if you're transferring property through a loan, you've got to charge at least that rate. And they're very low. So to transfer $300,000 will be equivalent over three years. The borrower 
is going to pay $1,982 in these family transfer arrangements. That's the total for the three years. Not much interest cost to transfer the asset. A million dollars of land over nine years, $97,000, about $10,000 of interest a year to transfer the land in a sale that's financed by the seller. So I bring that up because there's a lot of ways to do the succession planning. We've mentioned gifting. This is a sale. And today sales are pretty cheap to transfer. The cost of transfer in blue, pretty low. What about tax rates? Well, these um, are low. Uh, the lowest I've ever seen. Gary, true. Lowest federal tax rates I've ever seen since 1984. When I was a high school senior, the tax rate marginal at the highest level in the federal tax code was 70%. That's a big number. You make another $1,000, 700, 700 went to IRS. Out of that 1,000, that's a big number. Today is 37% much more favorable. And it's even less than that if it's business income, because you've maybe heard about this with your tax person, qualified business income deduction, QBIT. It means that 20% of your income is tax-free. So instead of paying 37% max, you're really only paying 29.6%. And it's only 19.2 if it's business income that gets QBIT on up to about 350,000 of income. That's a low rate. Never been that low before. Talk about raising it next year to 39.6. That's not in the bill yet. It's still in this level. Talk about eliminating this to some degree. Not in the current bill. Still here. Still good. Still low rates. Is there a good time to think about a succession plan that includes higher taxable income? and paying more tax? Yeah, it's now. Because the rates you're paying are the lowest we've ever seen. Now, that'll still add up to a pretty good tax bill. I mean, the average in 84 was $3,800. The average last year was 24,000. So there's still a lot more tax being paid because the income pool is so much larger. So we're charging a lower rate, but the pool's a lot deeper, so we're gonna collect more tax money still. So you're still paying a lot of tax in this level you know, 20% of 350000 is $70,000 of tax. Plus another 17000 for Illinois, that's eighty seven five. Plus another 20000 for self-employment, that's 107000 That's a lot of tax on 350000 My point is, though, it's still some of the lowest it's ever been. If you have a succession plan that you want to enact, be sure you're make, taking advantage of these lowest rates up to this income level. This is a problem in May of 21 that is gone. If this seminar was in May of 21, we'd have spent all our time talking about this slide. And today I'm saying, whew, we don't have to worry about this. There was a proposal to eliminate stepped up basis. More about that in a minute. There was a proposal to tax every transfer at death or at gift as if it was sold for fair market value. It has been devastating to our farm families to make any type of succession plan work. It was lowering the exemption amount that you get tax-free in the state. It was raising the tax rate from 40 to 45 or higher and would limit what you could do on like-kind exchanges, meaning trading land with someone else and not paying the tax till maybe sometime later. The good news is none of this is happening today. The Senate Finance Committee published 1180 pages Friday night. I'm, I'm up to the 800th page so far, reading what that thing says. And all that's, none of that stuff is in there. So what it does say is this, we're retaining our current federal estate exemption level, which next year will be 12 million per person and 24 million per couple. And we can trade this, I should, I mean not trade, we can share this exemption. So the example I usually give at tax schools is if I have $15 million of assets, Debbie would be thrilled, first of all, if that was true. But if I had 15, 
Oh, I don't mean 15. If I had 10, if I have 10, I need 10 as my exemption, but I left $2 million on the table. She can take my $2 million and she'll have $14 million of her own, which will be one other reason she'll be one of the most popular widows in Camp Point, right? Of all that tax free stuff. But we can share that exemption on the federal level. If you qualify for this thing, I'll show you that in a second, you get another $1.2 million per person. So that's $13 million per person. Oh my gosh, why am I so sticky with that button? $13 million per person here. If you're a farmer, you can use this. Your gift exclusion annually is $16,000 next year. For a lot of years, it's been $15,000, which means any one person can give any other person up to $16,000 in a year. It's not taxable. Don't have to report to IRS. It just happens. If it's over 16000 next year, you have to report it to the IRS, but there's still probably no tax on that gift until you've given away $12 million. Now you'll start to generate some tax. Uh, last year, farm operator estates that owed federal estate taxes, not very many, 0.16%. Less than 1% of the people had a federal estate tax liability with these really high exemption levels. Illinois, different, different rule. Four million dollars is all we have in Illinois. And Debbie and I can't share it. I get four, she gets four. We don't get eight as a couple. So we're interested in dividing assets so that we each have four million available. Here's what that looks like in Illinois to calculate the tax. And this is the biggest reason we think a lot about estate tax planning in Illinois. If my taxable estate was $8 million <clears throat> and I had not given any money away ever in my lifetime that exceeded the uh, annual 16,000 amount, my Illinois tax would be $680,000 at 8 million. I'm 4 million over the cap and 680,000 tax. If instead I have my still eight million, but I gave away three million, then I have a five million taxable. I have to add my three million back in for this calculation, but my tax drops to three hundred and fifty-two thousand. So I saved three hundred and thirty thousand, but I gave away three million to save three hundred and thirty thousand. Is that a good buy? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, and then if I gave six million away, I've got two million over here, still had eight because I had it back in, but now my tax is only 90,000. So I saved about 600,000, but I gave away six million. Is that a good buy? I don't know. What do you give up? I'll show you in a second. This is a calculator anybody can use. It's the only way to calculate Illinois state tax. Generally, you start at about a 25% tax rate once you're over four million. And we try to get out of that as much as we can. Let me go back one slide. You get this also in Illinois. So farm families, each person can have 5,230,000 of value before you get to Illinois state tax. And there's a lot of rules to qualify for this, but if you qualify, you can get up to five million. Here's what 2032A looks like. It's very commonly talked about when the states are going on, but here's the real math. <clears throat> Essentially what it's saying is because you're a farmer, you have a one-time uh, choice to revalue your farmland. And instead of putting the per acre value on it, you can put in a capitalized income value on it. So we start with a fair rental value, subtract real estate taxes, Divide by an interest rate that IRS provides, they publish this annually, and you do the math, you end up with my 2032A calculation of $5,844 an acre. That's just a math number, it doesn't mean anything except that's the math. And if my real fair market value was $12,000 an acre, which would normally be in my estate, except for the fact that I qualify and choose to use this, then I have a reduction in my estate of $6,000 an acre. But I can only reduce my 2032A value by not more than $1.23 million. 
That's the biggest use I can get out of that. So I only need 200 acres to maximize this reduction under 2032A. And if I own 330 acres, the other 130 is calculated at full market value. But it's a way to reduce my taxable state next year by $1.2 million on this many acres. What's the highest land sale in this neighborhood in the last six months? 17-1. Anybody want to top that? Anybody want to go buy it? 17-2, 17-3, 17-4, now 5, now 6, now 7. You saw what rents were in Adams County. We're not that good of a farming territory. White timber soil. We had a pretty good farm not far from our home family farm. About four miles that sold uh, last month. 19,000 an acre. Why? No good reason. Well, the reason was the buyer owns a hog building next door and he wanted to put manure on. And he's got a lot of money from non-farming activity. The seller bought that farm in the peak in 2012 for 14.5. Crazy price, 14.5. He owns a trucking company, he's selling out, moving to Arizona, sold his farm at a $4,500 gain in nine years. Pretty good. So if I put 19,000, my point is if I put 19,000 here, guys, I've got a $13,000 reduction, it only takes 100 acres to maximize my 2032A value. They can save a lot of tax. In Illinois, if I use that 1.23 million to save a state tax, I save $300,000. That's the value of it. It's good, very helpful. But you give this up. Stepped up base, this is a really big thing. It was targeted this spring to be wiped out. It's targeted a lot by various people who want to eliminate this. And uh, this is a big thing, not only if you have a taxable state, it's a big thing if you own $100,000 of equipment. It's a big thing. So what it means is the tax basis of the decedent's property gets reset to the fair market value on the day that they died. So let's say I have a $100,000 combine. I've depreciated it all out. I die tomorrow. It gets a new basis of 100. Debbie sells it the next day for 100. She pays zero tax on the sale. There's a lot of reasons she would like me deceased, isn't there? So I think about it through. If she keeps the combine, she depreciates it again. She deducts that over seven years and has a deduction if she's still farming. She can take a deduction of that combine again, even though I fully deducted it. It's great. Uh, it increases my land basis uh, from, let's say, $200 in 1945. Uh, my parents have a farm they bought. They paid $200 in that year. And today, it would reset. Well, that farm wouldn't, but it would reset to maybe $19,000, whatever the price is today. You could go all the way up there. The heirs sell it tax-free the next day. Crop inventory, this is huge. This happens all the time for our FBMM farm families. Gary, how many times do you see grain stepped up basis that saved the surviving spouse? Tons of them. Oh yeah, well, if you're a Schedule F still operating farmer as opposed to a landlord. You yeah, you're still a Schedule F filer uh, because you have inventory. It gets reset at the date of death. Of course, if you sold it the day before, it's all taxable income, right? Debbie can sell it the next day after I die. Tax-free money. All tax-free money. And whether we have an estate tax issue or not, none of that matters. All this happens for every farm family. It's a reason we want to be thinking about this for a succession because if I gave away my equipment and I die the next week, my heirs get stuck with zero basis. And they're not going to get the tax deduction. <coughs> But if, I, if they get it through my estate, they will get the new basis, they'll get the new deduction, they can sell it tax-free. One reason gifts have some downside is they don't get the stepped-up basis. If you own uh, stock on anything that trades on the, on the public uh, market, uh, it also gets a new basis, can be sold for no gain. If you have a corporation in your farm family, your basis gets a new, or your stock gets a new basis, can be sold tax-free. All these things are helpful. We have a partnership. 
the assets inside the partnership, get a new basis, can start being deducted again or sold tax-free. Guys, so many things that this stepped-up basis is out there, and that's why it's targeted, because people are getting deductions a second time. And so lawmakers don't always like that. But here's the problem with their theory, is it probably was taxed before. Just because I didn't have $4 million doesn't mean it didn't go to my estate and could have been subject to tax. If I had $8 million, it goes in my estate, it is subject to tax. So they paid the tax, now I get the new deductions. The benefit is, because we're below the exemption, we still get this nice benefit of the stepped-up basis provisions. Higher land basis, more depreciation, again, selling grain by the surviving spouse uh, tax-free. All right, that's a lot of cool stuff. Uh, what questions do we want to get covered here by our group, and what else do we want to cover? And you're coming up to help me answer questions? No. Oh, well, come on. Up. So a lot of things, been, yeah, let's open up, and uh, we have 10 or 15 minutes left, so sure. I'm trying to figure out your uh, step-up basis in partnership. Let's say one partner passes away. Is it a step-up? On the just, share. just the decedent's portion. Yeah, so the best example of that is uh, you and I own a combine in a partnership, and I die, uh, and Gary inherits my half, then he's going to get half of that combine that he can start depreciating. Again, he gets extra deductions that you don't get as, a, as the continuing partner. But yeah, the surviving decedent, or the decedent's property, new basis, Less gain of soul, more depreciation in between. Yes, sir. If you send uh, mom and dad to Florida for six months and a day. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, residency. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, so that's the general answer. Six months and a day. Yeah, if you're if you're not an Illinois resident. Um, you can avoid Illinois state tax on property that otherwise would be taxed in Illinois. And there are a couple unique court cases out about that. One of them is from Rahm Emanuel, you know, who was in the White House. I don't know there's a case about him about residency. But generally, that's the rule. It's, it's a little more involved than that. They really want to check to see, are you really a resident of Florida or any other state that doesn't have an estate tax? So I'm on a bank board too, and our bank owner lives in Florida a lot. And he's often in, in Florida when we have board meetings and he's on Zoom and he always says, good morning from Florida, because he wants to be sure that people know he's in Florida. So you have to kind of renounce your residency in Illinois, give up your property tax, um, uh, owner occupied exemption, you know, change whatever things need to happen. But yeah, if you are not an Illinois resident, you are not subject to Illinois estate tax, with this exception. Property that still is in Illinois is subject to Illinois tax. So if I move to Florida, but I still own 200 acres myself in Illinois, that 200 acres will be subject to Illinois estate tax, even though I live in Florida. But there's some thinking around there that if I put that land into an LLC, an S-Corp, or some entity, it magically gets converted from real estate to personal property, and that goes with me to Florida. Not been tested in court. I'm not sure the Attorney General Office buys that either, but residency is important. <laughs> Good questions. What else is out there? A lot of good numbers, a lot of good language. It's an important process and a difficult process. Um, mine is done. I've helped a lot of other people do them. I tell you, it's, it's hard. It's a hard thing to do, but it's an important thing to do. Richard, we're done, I think. I what, yes, sir, go ahead. Selling out uh, capital, equipment to the next generation. Even if it's on a timed basis, out for five years, ten years, I have to claim all that income up front, correct? Yes. Yeah, if you're selling depreciable property, uh, even on an installment basis, 
The IRS says you have to recapture all the depreciation you've claimed in the prior years in the year of sale. Whether you got all the money, none of the money, 10% of the money doesn't matter, you have to recapture that depreciation in the year of sale. That's one of the reasons dealing with machinery is so difficult because transferring it by what we would like to say, selling it on time with you as the seller with a 0.33% interest rate, you're stuck with all that taxable income in year one. So often we end up with a combination product that is a lease with some periodic purchase agreements allowed in that process. So I'm leasing the machinery and every year my successor can buy up to $50,000 of equipment from me in any one time. And so that still looks like a lease, avoids that problem, but that's a huge problem with uh, equipment, grain bins, hog buildings, all those things are taxed all in the year of sale where you get the cash on it. Yeah, thanks for raising that good point. All kinds of pitfalls laying out there. You can't do it without a good team to kind of walk you through, but I'm pretty confident if you know what you'd like to have happen, your team can probably get you there to make it happen. Yes, sir. If you're in a partnership, a partnership that has buildings and it has land, and you're ready to retire, but maybe some aren't, can you divide that partnership? Some take land, some take buildings. Uh, with, in other words, there's no other, the, uh, the basis would be what? Yes, so the beauty of partnerships compared to S corporations, what you described with an S corporation would be extremely difficult and be very costly to do. In a partnership, you can probably make that happen. In a partnership, you can take property distributions out of the entity and the person who acquires that property gets the basis that goes with that property. So they share the basis, it gets divided, and as long as there are no, this is a technical tax term, hot assets, That'll work as a tax-free distribution. Hot assets are things like grain inventory, farm equipment that's been fully depreciated, uh, hog buildings, grain bins could be a part of that too. Yeah, could be hot assets. So if you have hot assets, they've got to be distributed equally. If you don't have those hot assets, you can distribute it in kind of any way that you would like. Uh, value for value and the basis in that partnership asset gets distributed to where it goes. So you can use property distributions in a successor arrangement for partnerships and LLCs taxes partnerships much better than the corporate world can. Could that be over time? Uh, no, you can do that. Uh, you can do it all at once. It doesn't have to be over time. It can be over time, but it doesn't have to be over time. Yeah, LLC property partnership distributions are a really key tool, but you have to watch this crazy thing called hot assets. Can't distribute those unequally without creating tax. Good questions. These are pretty high level questions, Richard, that we're getting here. This is good stuff. Um, do you see any problem with uh, your successor if like, they just pay the difference, like when you trade or upgrade stuff, so you're sharing? Is there anything negative? Yeah, I think that's very common that, uh, you know, uh, my son and I own a, a tractor together and we're going to trade. The trade difference is 30 grand. He's going to pay the 30 grand. And so now what is the question? So I would say that I would own if my value was 50 and uh, we've got an $80,000 tractor now. I own five eighths of it. He owns three eighths of it. And that leads us to the problems of if he needs a mortgage or a lien on that tractor to get financing, the lien's gonna be on five-eighths of your tractor too, so we can't split it. Uh, who's gonna insure the tractor, who repairs the tractor, all those things, so you have some joint ownership of equipment. So it's an easy mechanism, but as that gets more complicated, what we have seen farm families do then is say, okay, you own a fourth of the tractor, you own half of the grain cart, 38% of the combine, and 100% of the pickup truck. We're going to trade all this stuff around and the sun's going to end up with 100% of the combine and kind of eliminate all these fractional ownerships. So as long as you kind of keep track of that and don't get too crazy with it, uh, that part works okay. Um, 
But at some point, you'll want to simplify that and smash them together. One issue that we have in the current tax law is if you trade your tractor in, you sold it for 50 grand in my example. Didn't used to be that way. But now you've got a sale, but you've also bought back a $50,000 tractor and your son bought a 30. So you still have the mixed ownership, but a little different reporting. Good. Hey, great questions, everybody. Uh, good luck as you finish 2021. Lots of tax planning to happen, and 2022 is going to be another uh, fun year, I think, with lots of unusual things happening. Uh, happy holidays, best wishes in your tax and succession planning. Thanks for having FDFM be part of your evening. Thank you.